Take your Bibles tonight and go to Ephesians. In one sense, there is no other place in the Word I'd rather be than where we are tonight. In another sense, I would love to be other places because I'm so absolutely inadequate to teach what I'm supposed to teach is one of the reasons why I would like to avoid the particular location in Ephesians. Experientially, I am somewhat knowledgeable of the subject we're going to cover tonight, perhaps much more fully appreciative of it than knowledgeable. For most people, even in the way ministry, it's a nice word, and I'm talking about grace. It's something you say before meals. Sometimes it's a name of a beautiful lady. But for most people, it just continues to be a word. And boy, when it comes outside of the way ministry, it's been nothing but a word for most people. For me, this word grace, which is the first word in the second verse, by the way, chapter one, is an experience of indescribable reality. No person is capable of fully teaching what it's all about. It will take eternity to clarify it because we will have to see him face to face and know even as also we are known by him. In many circles of so-called Christendom where people believe in grace, it's nothing but a license to sin. The permissiveness to sin And if you get caught, you simply say, well, I'm sorry, and you start all over again. Nobody in this life will ever fully understand grace. You may experience it, but you'll never fully understand it, because I just do not know how anybody with his finite mind could understand the infinite God who made grace so totally available to men and women. The verse says, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're going to go no further than that first word. And I would say that from time to time as we get into Ephesians and more things dawn on me, I'll share more. But I tried in the process of about 10 hours of disciplined, renewed mind to put down a little bit of what I know about it from the word and didn't have enough time to put down enough because it takes more time. If you spent 10 hours putting down all your sins of the past, if you hadn't forgotten them like God did, you might be able to enumerate quite a number of them. Every one of us knows what the word is in Greek. We know it in Estrangilo Aramaic. We know it in Hebrew. We know all this stuff. It's like knowing the word electricity and spell it. <laughs> Grace is like that. First of all, I like to say all of us know that salvation is not of works, but it should certainly be unto works. The Greek word, of course, is charis, C H A R I S. The word joy has the same root of caro. And in Ephesians 6, The last verse, the first word is again what? The first word of verse 2 is grace. The second word is peace. In Ephesians 6, when God wraps it all up, this magnanimous, unbelievable epistle, he closes 23 with peace and ends it up with grace in 24. Twelve times this word is used in the epistle. It's used in verse 6 of chapter 1. To the praise of the glory of his, wherein he hath made us lovely and acceptable in the beloved, or lovely and acceptable. Used in verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins according to the riches of his what? Grace. Grace. Used in the second chapter in verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, you're saved. In verse 7 of chapter 2. 
that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Verse 8, For in grace or by grace are ye saved through faith of Jesus Christ and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Tremendous progressive unfoldment of grace. Chapter 3, verse 2. If ye have heard of the administration of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Verse 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among Gentiles the untrackable riches of Chapter 4, verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every one of us is given grace. In verse 29 of chapter 4. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Real significant, these verses, if your mind is at all coherent and tracking and alive and sharp. Imagine our ministering grace, our ministering grace to the hearers. We better be sure we're ministering right on what God said because he made the grace available. Otherwise, it will not be right where it ought to be. The other one, of course, is chapter 6, which I gave you a while ago. Grace with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in incorruptibility. Isn't that beautiful? Well, those are the 12 times in the epistle. Let's go back to its second usage in verse 6 of chapter 1. To the praise of the glory of his grace. The word praise gives me a key to grace. It's the word epiinos, up to God. So grace is not only something down from God, but it must have a reason up to God. The word glory, which is doxa, D-O-X-A, denotes the greatest of all recognition, but not of a person himself, but the appearance of that which attracts attention. As I understand it, in some sense, it's the manifested power, like the manifestations I heard a little while ago, among other things, to the praise of the glory of his grace. His grace, his grace, wherein he hath made us lovely and acceptable, or acceptable and lovely. He hath made us acceptable, A-C-C. See, it's to the praise of his glory upward that he made us downward when he came into us. He made us acceptable. He made us. He made us. Now, if he made us, then we didn't make ourselves. Then we had no more to do with it in the sense of he making us than I did my first birth. And I had absolutely nothing to do with it. In that same sense, you have absolutely nothing to do with grace. It is God directed to man, and you and I have absolutely nothing to do with it. I think I can clarify this a little further for you. If we go back to Luke, where its first usage is in the gospel that I like very much, Luke chapter 1. 
Verse 28. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail, highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Hail, highly favored. Highly favored is the same word as Ephesians 1, 6. Cut it to lovely. And cut it to, that's the root of it, you see, C-H-A-R-I-T-O-O. -O. This word in verse 6 is in one of the research pieces that I've written through the years. Someplace it's in writing. Now Luke one twenty eight, highly favored, is this word cut it to. And katatu takes its form from the word karis, which is grace. The angel said unto Mary, Hail, lovely one, <laughs> beloved, acceptable. Hail, you one of grace. What did God have to do to do what God said he was going to do to her? <laughs> she had no husband. She had no intercourse. And ordinarily, that's the only way you can get pregnant. And he uses the word grace regarding her pregnancy. So grace must include bringing into existence or beginning into existence something that has no other reason for coming except that God does it. And he created within her that soul life. I think that's fantastically revealing when it comes to the word grace. You see that record in Ephesians 2 that we read, 2 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. It takes the book of Ephesians to make known the exceeding riches of his grace. No other record in the whole word makes as distinctively and fully known the exceeding riches of his grace as does the book of Ephesians. And it's significant that that is tied together with 3.8 am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the untrackable riches of Christ. So grace is exceeding all definition. Grace is so fantastically grace that it's totally untrackable. The conception of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke, highly favored, grace. 1 6 of Ephesians. He hath made us, he made us lovely and acceptable. He made us acceptable. When you were born into the first family, if it was under the proper arrangement and all this other stuff, I'm quite confident you were acceptable. As a matter of fact, they were tickled to death, you had a ride. In the new birth, God in Christ hath made us acceptable. Did we deserve coming the first time? We didn't deserve coming the second time either. It's grace. The first one is a natural application. The second one is heavenly or divine. That's why verse 7 says, In whom we have that's grace, redemption, in whom we have it through his blood, the remission of sins according to the riches of his grace. As chapter 2, verse 1 says, even you who were dead in trespasses and sins, to have remission of sins when you are dead, 
in trespasses and sins. That's grace. Like he made Mary's womb alive with Christ in her. So he makes us spiritually alive with Christ in us. That's grace. The greatest paradox of grace that I know is that it's so extremely valuable. It can be nothing less than free. I will say it again, and I hope someday it gels in all of your minds, the bigness of what I've just said to you. It is so extremely valuable It has to be free. It is so costly, you couldn't even begin to get close to it because it's just so valuable. It's just so way out. It has to be absolutely free. That's grace. That's why 2.5 said, even when we were dead, quickened us by grace. And verse 8, by grace you are saved through believing. And verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is interesting that Psalm 49, has a remarkable thing to say here in Verse 7. None of them can by any means. You see, verse 6, they trust in their wealth. They boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, their intellectual pursuits, all of those things. But none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Verse 9, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. Verse 8, the parentheses, for the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. This ceases forever is interesting because... I think it was C.D. Ginsburg where I learned that the translation literally should be forever unachievable. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever. For the redemption of their soul is forever unachievable. So if it's forever unachievable, then man's wealth, man's riches... Man's redemption of his brother, man giving to God a ransom for his brother is forever what? All right. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, in verse 14, and by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable what? A gift you can't even talk about. It's so big, you just say, you talk about it, say gift, but really you can't talk about it. It's so extremely valuable if you had a million. Don't even talk about it. You couldn't buy it. It's free. It's so extremely valuable. That's the paradox of it that it has to be unalterably free. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it is so free that verse 19 says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of Phenumahagion? which is in you, which you have a God, and you are not your what? That's right. That's grace. You're not your own. That's grace. For you are bought 
You're purchased, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body because of grace. This is the phase of grace unto works. Grace is not of works, but it is unto. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 18. For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your lousy existence, <laughs> by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's grace. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. A little later on, I'll tell you more about that. Not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's grace. Forever unachievable. Remember? It is again, not with corruptible things as silver and gold. Forever unachievable by that. But with the precious blood of Christ. Yes. In Hebrews 10, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats was the furthest the law could go. It's as far as man could go under the law. Verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And in verse 10, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So the mass is as about as far out of it as it could be massed out of it. He dies daily. What a bunch of baloney. Then it's works, not grace. Grace is grace. Boy, oh boy. In Colossians chapter 1. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unimpeachable in his sight. That's grace. How little we've appreciated. Else we'd walk greater. <laughs> the walk is indicative of lack of appreciation. You know. You tell your wife you love her like crazy and keep beating the hell out of her. <laughs> and the words are just words, the action. Our action is indicative that we understand grace, at least have a approximated an understanding of at least a portion of it. Present you holy, unblameable, and unimpeachable. In 1 Corinthians 15, please. Verse 4. He was buried, and that he has been raised the third day, according to the script. That's grace. When Jesus Christ appeared upon the scene, this one we're just reading about, here, these last six, seven, eight verses. Someone said, Behold, the Lamb of God taketh away what? That's right. That's what Ephesians 1 7 is all about, among other things. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood. Redemption through his blood we have according to the riches of his grace. Redemption includes remission of sins. It is a redemption from things that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't cover, the blood of Christ did. It's a redemption from sin and sins, both the cause and the consequences. But this grace is not only a redemption from, but it's a redemption unto. That's why I said to you when I began tonight that it's not of works, but it is what? Unto Unto works. Because it has two great massive phases in it. The Lamb represents the deliverance or redemption from. 114 represents the redemption unto, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto or until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. It's the earnest of our inheritance. Until, but also unto the redemption, the earnestness, the token thereof, until the return of Christ. So as the Lamb in the Bible indicates deliverance or redemption from sin, the other part of grace is indicated the redemption unto in no other field any greater than the knowledge that the word gives on the kinsman redeemer. And when you understand the work of the kinsman redeemer from the word and from Eastern culture background, you get even a greater appreciation and knowledge of this grace. 